Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us an instruction manual, a, a map of life, Lord. Uh, there's so many ways of explaining what your word is. And Holy Spirit, you are our teacher, and we ask that you would help us understand how to put on the new man and take off the old. Heavenly Father, we ask you to give us your passion. And where our thoughts and our desires are not aligned with you in this way, we ask you to change us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, real quickly, a correction I wanted to make. When I had talked about the, wet, the mother whose last name is Wesley, I called her Sarah, but she's actually Susanna. <laughs> so that was an error on my part I wanted to correct. Um, I love that story about her life. Uh-oh. So today, I would entitle today's message, Old Man versus New Man. Talk about a list, right? Such comparisons in the book. Um, you could really see the highlight, Paul hitting the new and the transformed versus the old and untransformed. Well, we want to become the new and the transformed, and that's what we become when we place our faith in Christ. We know this. But let's look at what being, what a human really, a human being really is to understand what is in fact new and transformed. Many of you may already know we are triune. Interestingly, like the Godhead, we also have, we are also three in one. In our case, we are body, soul, and spirit. We have a body that houses the soul, mind, which is the mind, will, and emotions. Our soul is the mind, will, and emotions, and we have a spirit. Paul called the body a tent. Remember, he referred to our body as a tent. Upon creation, God breathed life into man, and when he formed him out of the dust of the earth. Genesis 1, a and 27 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being, Genesis 2.7. Now, where is the human spirit in this verse? We don't see the words human spirit, but we do see, what we do see is the breath, the wording breath of life. In Hebrew, the original language of the Old Testament, the word translated as breath is neshama. This same Hebrew word is translated as spirit in Proverbs 20, verse 27, which says the spirit of, the, of man is the lamp of Jehovah. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. 1 Corinthians 15, 4. We remember Jesus made clear to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 that a person needs a new birth by his spirit. Jesus responded and said to him, speaking of Nicodemus, truly, truly, I say to you, Nicodemus, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In essence, Jesus took the time to explain to this seeking Pharisee, Nicodemus, that he needed a rebirth of his spirit in order to get to heaven, and not what the Jews depended on, which was adherence to the law. That the spirit of God births within him a brand new spirit, not going back into his mother's body like he thought literally. That which is born of the spirit is spirit, Jesus said. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. So once we're born again, our worship of God comes from our spirit connecting to his. Our body and our soul have their specific functions. Only our new spirit gives us the ability to fellowship with God. We can see this in numerous verses, including John 4.24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Our human spirit is so important to God that he wants to fill it with himself. 
He wants to re- us to receive him and become one with him. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful that our Father, our God, loves us so much that he wants this, this united connection with his kids? I just think that is just so, so awesome. So, again, we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. That which is born of flesh, Jesus told Nicodemus, is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit, Jesus said. Now, in the Recovery Version Bible, in note two, it says, the first spirit mentioned here is the divine spirit, the Holy Spirit. And the second spirit mentioned is the human spirit, the regenerated spirit of man. Regeneration or rebirth is accomplished in the human spirit by the Holy Spirit with God's life. Therefore, to be regenerated is to be made new, a new creation with God's spirit living within two. So the moment we receive Jesus, putting our faith, meaning putting our faith, our trust, and our reliance on Jesus as our Lord and Savior, his spirit immediately enters us. I just, it's amazing. By simply, by faith receiving him, he comes in. Just boom. <clears throat> We are born of God. We've received eternal life at that moment, and we've become a child of his. Isn't that beautiful? Now, there is an interesting dynamic. Since the three live together, body, soul, and spirit, and his spirit now too, our new spirit coexists with our soul and our body, but One new challenge that the new spirit has, the new creation that wants to love and live with and please God, is with our unregenerated soul when it doesn't agree. Our soul, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions, needs to come into submission to God. Our mind has a lot of old information in it. It has memories, both good and bad. If If you came to Christ as an older person, There's a lot of history you've lived through, right? A lot of information is in there. It was received, let's say, um, as instruction over the years, both good and bad. There's truth and lies we've had it put into our head. It has received through the eye gate, observation of parents and siblings, extended family, teachers, neighbors, all it has been in contact with since birth or even conception. I understand that babies can hear. Uh, in, when they're in the womb, they can hear the mother's voice and the father, and if there's arguing or whatever. Or if there's wonderful harmony in music, you know, it's just the baby can hear. The ears have heard many things, both good and bad, and the mind stores it all like computer data that influences our body and spirit, thus our actions. I know this isn't really new news, but I like breaking things down to little bite-sized pieces of understanding because of this particular text that we're going through today. So Paul exhorted the church in Rome and Ephesus to what? Renew their their mind. Renew their minds and choose to follow God's instruction. To quote, he said, put on the new man and put off the old. Paul said adamantly, because the soul does not automatically follow the new spirit. The Holy Spirit helps, but the surrender of the old dying self, as Jesus put it, must take place daily in order to put on the new. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed. This is Paul writing to the Romans. Do not be conformed to this world, and you've all heard this verse before, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And then he writes to the Colossians, Chapter 3, 2 and 3, set your minds, he he exhorts, set your minds on things above and not on the earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. And then 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, Paul's talking to the Corinthians here. Meanwhile, he's pretty much in jail. Most, Most of the time he's writing these letters. Isn't it pretty crazy? So do not lose heart, he says, while in prison. 
Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. And Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And John MacArthur is, is quoted saying, sanctification, which is your life being set apart, sanctification begins with spiritually renewing the mind that is changing how we think. And I think I heard a pastor recently say, quote the verse that as a man thinks, so is he. So there's just so much um, influence that the mind has on our, on our conduct. So Paul knew instruction was needed to alert the church to place their mind on God's word for renewal, vital to seeing their behaviors align with God's character, which is his desired outcome for our earthly lives. The apostle is right. Our new man needs truth data, I call it, truth data. Because the mind is the control center of the body, so to speak. God wants us to be able to have the appropriate information to live according to his plan. It then will affect our emotions and our behaviors. Whatever you believe with your mind is how it, it will influence your emotions. Um, we women are very sensitive and tender. And we sometimes get overcome with emotions, and sometimes that over being overcome has to do with why, how, what we're perceiving about the circumstance. Have you noticed that? So if we're believing a lie, we might get upset about nothing. <laughs> Have you ever done that? I've never done that, no. <laughs> So Paul tells the Ephesians that he and the Lord do not want them to live as the Gentiles live. In your homework, you looked at those things. I like the amplified breakdown. Gentile living, he puts it, and I'm not going to say it exactly as you see it there. But in, in futility of their minds, he puts it. I put it as in the nothingness of their minds. <laughs> And number two, as unwise they, they were not to live, with emptiness of soul was the way they lived, having darkened understanding, even spiritually blind. Literally, they cannot see. Their reasoning is clouded, alienated, and self-banished from the life of God. Spiritually blind because of the hardness and insensitivity of the heart. Ungodly in their spiritual apathy they become callous. You know what happens to your fingertips and your hands when you're working a lot with your hands. What happens to them? They get calloused, and then you don't feel as easily. You don't feel with that finger. It's the same dynamic with our hearts. If sin is, is bludgeoning our heart over and over and over again, it becomes calloused, and it cannot feel. So therefore, if you see people who seem insensitive, there is a callousness that has grown in their heart. Given themselves over to improper sensuality, so don't live like that and, and don't desire that which is impure, which is what they want. Paul went on to say, but you did not learn Christ this way. He said firmly. He knew this kind of living was far, far from God's nature and that it would grieve the Holy Spirit if they walked that way. How many of you have ever felt in your spirit, in your heart, the Holy Spirit's grief? Have you ever felt that? Sometimes we might think it's our own. But like if let's say we're, we're you know, engaged in a situation and suddenly something is happening that is a sinful thing, a criminal activity or something going on and you're like kind of somehow caught in the middle of it for a moment. Sometimes you can feel the Holy Spirit's very sad. His grief is in you. So Paul went on to remind them that they were taught by Christ and that truth was in him, in Christ. They were, in verse 22, to rid themselves again of the old. Here's the put on, take off, put on, take off, rid, take, put on good, take off the old. And where is this old self? The mind. I believe that's what Paul is identifying is the mind. Then he emphatically tells them to speak the truth to his neighbor because we are parts of one another. So part of putting on Christ was being truthful, speaking truth to each other. 
If we don't speak the truth, relationships are built on a false premise. God doesn't lie to us. He wants our relationships built on truth just as he speaks the truth to us. God's character is truth. And we are to imitate our Lord in our relationships. Otherwise, well, we know it wouldn't be healthy. So Paul even said emphatically, be angry, but do not sin. <laughs> I know sometimes in some circles, they, they don't think being angry is right at all. But Paul is saying, be angry, but don't sin. Well, how is that? Well, we are supposed to get upset over sinful things and criminal activity. If you see somebody's house getting robbed and you get upset, that's a good thing. If you were like, oh, so what? You know, there would be something wrong, you know, if you just feel so callous about that. Now, if we don't know people, we can't get as upset as if we're, we know somebody that's been hurt. But we should get upset when others are hurt, when there's injustice or cruelty or bullying, any behavior that destroys others, it's okay. I'm not saying you should get it. I'm just saying it's okay. If it upsets you, it's okay. Just we are not to act out sinfully in our anger. In fact, anger is such an intense negative emotion that we're not to end our day being angry. As a young married Christian myself, I used to think that that meant resolving the issue with my husband before we went to sleep. Poor Rick. <laughs> I would keep him awake late on our work nights to resolve a disagreement that I perceived was hurtful. And boy, that was tough. He was one to go to sleep so bad. <laughs> well, now I know that it's the angry emotion that Paul was talking about, not the issue that made me angry. Now I know that I can let the anger go and put my concerns in God's hands and look into it another day. Like if Rick was saying, please, can we talk about this tomorrow? <laughs> you know, then I need to be, okay. You know, and then let my anger go. I have to go resolve that somehow. You know, go away, go to the bathroom, go downstairs, whatever, and just get some coffee or tea and <sighs> take out your scriptures. <laughs> read something that comforts you and gives you some promises to, you know, resolve in your own heart. And then you can work on the issue the next day. <clears throat> but it is interesting. Isn't it interesting? I find even the Bible has good psychological counsel. And in this case, we are not to go to sleep when we're upset. So we must rid our anger, let go of it before we hit the pillow. Even if the problem is not resolved, let it wait, as I said, to the next day. Give it to the Lord, release it, and go to sleep. <laughs> Easier said than done, I know. But it is significant, so significant that Paul, the apostle, gave such a strong word about it, right? Now, he knew nothing, <coughs> sorry, he knew not doing so gives the devil a foothold. This is an interesting dynamic with going to bed angry and staying angry. It gives the devil a foothold. Another way of thinking about it is it, it lets the devil get his foot in the door. So the foothold term that Paul is using, it means that which sustains the feet and prevents them from slipping. Like here in this case, the door is slammed over the foot. He's got his foot in the door. He's firmly planting his foot in the door. We do not want the devil to have that place in our life, right? And how does he do it? If we go to bed angry, which makes us vulnerable, emotionally vulnerable. So Paul did not want the devil to have stable ground on which to act. He knew the devil always looks for a vulnerability. Now remember, ladies, we need to remember we are in a war. I know we're women. We're not soldiers in outwardly. But we are spiritual soldiers. And the devil really is in the battlefield. Looking, he's always looking to see how he can wreak havoc in your life, right? We have that target on our back. I know we don't, I want to pull it off, but it's going to always be there until we go to heaven. Um, apparently going to bed angry is a way to create this vulnerability. So that is a really critical thing that Paul brought up. And then if those, if the previous words were not strong enough, wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> Work to be able to give to others and not steal. He was applying this mostly, um, there, were, uh, there were slaves and masters at that time, and slaves had a tendency to, to, to do a lot of theft. So he was addressing those that had a tendency to steal 
and he wanted to apply, don't do that, don't steal, but work to give. You know, he wanted to give them the opposite dynamic in their head. And then he goes on to say, don't use toxic or hurtful words. Only speak words that build others up. Now that's a challenge, isn't it? Don't we sometimes want to blurt when we're upset with our family member? You know, but we're not to do that. So if you want to blurt, bite the tongue. <laughs> It really is important, and I know it's hard when you've got little ones. It's Paul, Dr. Dobson says that having preschool children is the hardest time in your life. I believe that, because I was there once, and it's very difficult. It's very difficult because there's a constant emotional demand on you. So you need Jesus a lot, don't you? So Warren Wiersbe says the remedy to this whole toxic word thing. He says, the remedy is, from Warren Wiersbe, is to make sure the heart is full of blessing. Now, it sounds trite. But so fill the heart with the love of Christ so that only truth and purity can come out of the mouth. And as I've said before, when I had little ones and I was homeschooling and I was teaching Sunday school at that time because God was like, like okay. You know, this is overwhelming, Lord, and have these little ones. So I had to pray every day, and I made sure they went down for a nap, and I had my prayer time. It was not always undisturbed, mind you, but I, I had to make sure that I, because, you know, when you come out of something dark or not good, when you have a tendency, it kind of propels you to be sure you try to be the opposite, right, when you're aware. So coming out of a very tense home and nervous home, my mother was like, don't, don't, like that, you know, you're going to spill crumbs. I mean, there was just such a tension, you know, as a kid. So I determined I was not going to let my home be a tense home. I wanted my children to feel peaceful and relaxed and happy-go-lucky. And yes, I'll train them too, you know. But, and that, anyway. Boy, that was a tangent. Sorry about that. Um, but, you know, it is hard. I know it's hard, whether you're working at, away from home or you're working in the home, being a housewife and a mother, and you're working maybe doing both. You know, you're juggling everything. How much more do we need Jesus? Amen. And time with him to fill you so you have a heart that's full of blessing. And don't grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, he acts like he's a person or something. <laughs> but he is, isn't he? I love the song we sang earlier about raining, Holy Spirit rain down on me. And the singer, the original singer said, my comforter and friend. And you know, the longer you know the Lord and you are filled with the Spirit, you embrace the Holy Spirit as a friend because he's right there in you always. And he's helping you, guiding you, directing you, counseling you, teaching you. He's giving you all these wonderful things. He is a dear friend. So don't grieve him, he says, Paul said. And then Paul lastly says, get rid of all bitterness and wrath, extreme anger, anger, strife, and slander. You know, I'm sorry, I'm being dramatic, but you know, Paul was very adamant. It is a human weakness, right? And then take out all this immoral trash. Thank you. There's, there's, there's. So how do we do that? I hear you ask. Well, here's an illustration, and I know you've heard Willie share this story too, but it came to mind as I was preparing there is a story from a Native American elder who once described his own inner struggles to understand the Bible and Christianity. He said, inside of me, he said, there are two dogs. The black dog is mean and tries to talk to me or talk me into making wrong choices. The white dog is good and encourages me to make the right choices. The black dog fights the white dog all day. When I ask my... When asked by the friend which dog wins, the elder reflected for a moment and he replied, the one I feed the most. And most of us are the same way. There is a part of us that is Christ-minded, compassionate, trusting, open, abundant, and focused on helping others. That's our white dog. Or we could say our spirit man the whole, that's been birthed, regenerated, and born again. And then we have the self-minded, fearful, habitual, controlling, anxious part of us that is generally focused on our limitations and preserving the status quo. Could that be our mind? Maybe our black dog? And these two parts are in a constant struggle. If we feed our white dog, 
with the word of God from the Bible and try to walk in the spirit while focusing on helping others, our lives, he says, will be much more fulfilling and pleasing to God. Those were wise words from that elder. So Paul goes on to conclude his admonishment. Be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just like Christ forgave you. Amen. I love this psalm where, I think it's Psalm 18, where David is speaking of God. And he's saying, in your condescension and your gentleness, you made me great. And that was when I was a young mother that that verse struck me so hard. Because God was teaching me, Mary, get down on their level, because I get down on your level, and be calm, be calm and gentle. Because when you're calm and gentle with them, you strengthen them on the inside. And like God did that for David, that made David great. He rose up as a king, didn't he? As a child, he had a relationship with God as a shepherd boy. And he saw God do amazing things through him, didn't he? And his faith grew as a result of God's greatness in coming down on David's level and being gentle with David. And that's how, why. That's why we're not supposed to be coercive towards others and demanding and pushing and shoving and yelling at each other because it causes our spirit man to just kind of want to shrivel up. So when scripture gives commands, we know it's for us to act. Uh, of our own volition, we choose how to work towards good behavior, right? Because it's coming from our mind. But I'm sure many of you think, well, wait, I can't be that good all the time. I just can't. Life is too hard. I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I failed time and time again. Well, that's been my cry. But I want to encourage you sometime today, you know, and during the week, read Romans 6 through 8. Romans 8 is my all-time favorite chapter, book in the Bible, even, because it's the hope. It's the hope for the ones that are, that are flailing, <laughs> trying to be good. Because having been raised in mostly a non-Christian home, I didn't know the Bible, I know the Lord, and I've got to rush through this, sorry. I've got to jump over that. I want to give you some hope, because we know that God wouldn't tell you to do something he didn't enable you to do. Right? He's not going to do, do that. That's not God's character. He loves us, and he wants to equip us, and he has equipped us. For example, in Ezekiel, there was a prophecy that Ezekiel made, and, it, and it's Ezekiel 36. So let's jump to slide 22. These, you might want to take a, just a photo of all those verses, and, and I'm going to read them off to you. God promised through Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27, Moreover, I will give you a new heart. Here was the prophecy of being born again. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. I see God putting a desire in our heart to do what is right. In your new man, that new spirit is going to yearn to want to please God. And, and he does change us at the rebirth. And it's just beautiful. It's a beautiful uh, promise. And then Ezekiel 11, 19a. And I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. And then Ezekiel 37, 14. I will put my spirit within you and you will come to life. Isn't that beautiful? And Acts 1, 8. Jesus is speaking to his followers. He's saying, but you will. Because he's, he's got to leave, but he's going he's gonna to send the third person of the Trinity down. And he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. That's a very familiar verse. But it's a promise to us. And then in Ephesians 5.18, which we will get to in other teachings and study, but Paul is saying, and do not be drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, why would he say that? Why would he say, be filled with the spirit if you already have the spirit in you? Because it's a different kind. When you, it's like taking a glass of water. You pour the water in there. Okay, there's water in there. But is it full? When you just blop a little bit of water? No, you've got to keep pouring. 
So be filled with the Spirit. Then John 14, 26, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you, another form of help. And Romans 8, 26, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for utterance. Now, and then here, Paul, uh, Peter, an apostle, reciting the prophecy in Joel 2, 28 and 29, in Acts 2, 17 and 18 said, and it shall be, referring to this is happening now, guys, when Joel said, and it shall be in the last days that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will on those days pour forth my spirit, and they shall prophesy. He gave the power of the Holy Spirit and his gifts for the edification and the maturity of the body of Christ to form her into Christ's likeness. The power of the Holy Spirit was prophesied in the Old Testament, including the help that he would bring through the gift of prophecy, visions, and dreams. This prophesied power, or dunamis, by his agape love, the God kind of love, manifested in these ways. When, they, when the power came, when the Holy Spirit came, immediate result was speaking in a new language. He gave power to witness, ministered in healings, power to pray, power to discern, and power to understand his word. The effects of the manifestation of this power, in a nutshell, is to bring people to Christ to build up the body of Christ and to glorify him. God will help you and I put on the new man and put off the old. He has already provided himself to help. His hand is reaching out to you. And as I wrote this, I remembered Willie had said the same thing Sunday, and I had already written this. I go, yes, that's the Holy Spirit speaking. He is reaching out to you saying, I have what you need. I have everything you need. Just reach out to me and receive it by faith in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for making us a new creature through your son, Jesus. Continue to teach us your ways every day. We desire to have your thoughts and desires. Continue to change us, Lord, and, and help us renew our minds and obey your words to have the power to choose wisely every day, every hour, and every minute. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit. We need your divine enablement, Lord. We need your power to make it through every day. In Jesus' name, amen.